Take a couple of good long, deep in and out breaths. Notice where you feel the process of breathing in the body. You don't have to focus just on the, the air coming in and out of the nose. Because the air isn't doing anything. It's the body that's doing something. That's the wind element in the body, the energy that allows the air to come in to go out. That's what you want to focus on. So notice where you feel that most prominently, most clearly, and allow your attention to settle there. It doesn't have to be one tiny point. In fact, eventually the Buddha wants you to have a whole body awareness. So you could focus, say, on the chest, on the abdomen, in the middle of the head, wherever the energy flow feels most prominent and also most comfortable, where it feels really satisfying to breathe. If you lose focus, come right back. If having a large area of focus is hard, well, you can go back to the one spot. But it's good in the beginning to stay away from spots up in the head. Because so it puts a lot of pressure on the nerves in the head. You want to be down in the body. Then when you can stay with the breath and it's comfortable, then allow your awareness to spread so you feel like the whole body is breathing in, the whole body is breathing out. Because if the breath gets comfortable but the area of awareness is too small, you lose your focus on the body. You drift away. But the whole purpose of getting the mind into right concentration is to have a full body awareness so that your awareness is stable, centered but broad. The fact that it's centered means that you're still and can watch things as they come and they go and don't have to come and go along with them. The fact that it's broad means you can catch things from different angles, things coming in and out of the mind that you might have missed if you're focused just on the one spot. So this kind of centered but broad awareness is good for the body, it's good for the mind. Healing for the body, healing for the mind. And it allows you to see things in the mind you didn't see before. It's an act of kindness to be doing this to yourself. It's a way of showing goodwill for yourself. Goodwill is part of right resolve. It's also part of right concentration. The two go together. Right resolve is the resolve not to cause harm, not to cause affliction. And there are different ways that we cause harm. One is through sensuality, another is through ill will, and then it's through the intention of harmfulness. We want to avoid those things. After all, the teachings of the Buddha are about putting an end to suffering and stress. And when you realize that suffering and stress come from your actions, then you want to resolve in a way to act that doesn't cause any suffering, doesn't cause any stress. So that's how right view and right resolve are connected. And right resolve gives focus to right view. After all, right view is focused on the problem of suffering. In fact, the Buddha was focused on that problem and not on other problems. It's a sign of his goodwill. He sees that beings are suffering. He wanted to give them a teaching that would get them past that, help them to escape from that, from the suffering that they were causing themselves. So right view, right resolve. Go together with right concentration in this way. So this is an expression of goodwill. You sometimes hear the teachings that the mind naturally has goodwill, and it's just a matter of letting your feelings out in their natural way. But the Buddha never said that. He actually called goodwill a kind of restraint. In other words, you realize that there are good and bad intentions in the mind, good and bad voices in the mind. And you have to learn to tell which is which, and not follow the ones that are going to cause suffering. That means you don't 
just go with what you feel. You have to think about the consequences of what your actions are. In this way, goodwill goes together with another quality the Buddha called compunction. Realizing that if you're not skillful in what you do, you can cause some pretty bad harm. So you have to restrain yourself. You have to think about the consequences of your actions. You have to be willing to resist the impulse to just do what you feel like doing. Or some voice in the mind says, do this, and you don't just run with it. You have to ask yourself, what are the consequences? Now, to keep the mind in a position where it's not looking for instant gratification all the time, that's why we have to do the right concentration to give a sense of well-being. So we're not so hungry all the time. When the mind's hungry, it will jump at anything. It can convince itself of anything at all. That this should be done, or that should be said, or this should be thought. Because it's looking for some kind of quick way of finding happiness. Whereas the Buddha says, we're going to have, the path requires some patience. You can't be lazy in the path, but at the same time, you can't be impatient in the path. You have to take things step by step as they happen, as the mind is ready to develop. And that kind of patience requires that you have a sense of well-being that you can tap into inside. And so this is one of the uses of concentration, is to provide that foundation of well-being. So the mind isn't so quick to jump at whatever it wants to do or feels like doing. It's feeling well-nourished, feeling strong inside. And then when the idea of doing or saying or thinking something comes up, you can ask yourself, well, what would the long-term consequences be? And it won't be too impatient. I'd be willing to take the long-term into account. Because after all, that's what the principle of karma is all about. Actions are good or bad, not because you like to do them or don't like to do them. They're skillful or unskillful because of the consequences where they lead you. And if you have genuine goodwill for yourself and goodwill for others, you have to think about the consequences. This means that getting the mind still in a position where it's not so quick to jump after things is a gift to yourself and to other people around you. It's the kind of restraint that really does express goodwill. To allow the mind to have this sense of well-being inside. Don't be too impatient to push on to what you think may be the next step. Because whatever's going to come up, the real insights that come into the mind are going to sometimes be disappointing in the sense you see you were stupid in ways you didn't think you were stupid. And you have to be willing to look at ways in which you've been dishonest with yourself, ways in which you've been lying to yourself ways in which you've been careless, heedless, and not get knocked over by them. You have to have the strength inside to admit the truth of these things so you can actually deal with it. Because after all, that's what ignorance is all about. The mind lies to itself. And John Shaw once had an interesting statement. He said that watching the mind means trying to catch the mind lying to itself. It's not just a matter of watching things come and go and being okay with their coming and going. You have to be able to see, where is the mind lying? Because that's what the ignorance is. And the ability to see that and not get knocked away from, by it and not resist or deny it requires an inner strength, an inner sense of well-being. And that's what the concentration is for. So however long it takes the mind to get thoroughly settled. Be willing to take that time, however long it takes for it to heal its sense of being frazzled by things outside. Don't be too quick to jump to what you think is the next stage in the practice. As the Buddha said, have some respect for concentration. Have respect for the fact that this may take time, but it's worthwhile. And even if you find it easy to get the mind into concentration, you still have to stick with it for long periods of time. So the mind will have that sense of stability, the mind will have that sense of well-being inside, where it doesn't feel the need to 
jump after things. So we have an hour. That's all you have to do for the hour. Get the mind into a sense of stillness and learn how to maintain it there. And not jump after the impulses that come up in the mind. Then when it goes someplace further, the further of the meditation, the further of the practice is actually in the mind in concentration. As you stick with it, it matures. It's like a fruit that you give the time to get all the sun it needs, all the water it needs. One of the giants in Thailand said it's like having a mango. The mango in your tree is green. Someone says, well, your, your mango is unripe. What you want is a ripe mango. Then you can eat it. Ripe mangoes are yellow and they're soft. Your mango is green and hard. So if you're foolish, you'd squeeze the mango, paint it yellow. But you don't get the ripe mango that way. You can get the ripe mango by looking after the roots of the trees, watering it, giving it more sun, more water, making sure the bugs don't get to it. And as you protect the mango, the mango will, will mature and ripen. It's the same with the mind. You protect your concentration, and it will mature and ripen. become something you actually can rely on. Much better than using your preconceived notions to squeeze it in some direction or to paint it something else that it's not. So, show some respect for your concentration. That's a way of showing goodwill for yourself as well. <laughs>